Okay, we're live. All right. Um, well, I don't even have the agenda up. Hold. Oh, sorry. <clears throat> okay. Um, well, hello, everybody. And Nancy, can you uh, do the public input statement, please? Sure. Uh, the first public input session is a 15 minute session with each person having no longer than three minutes in which to make a statement. But a second public input session may be held at the end of the meeting if allowed by the board chair. The speaker will give her, her name, uh, address, and reason for speaking. Public input is designated for district residents, but the board chair may grant non residents the opportunity to address the board. Statements concerning subject matter that falls under the law regarding executive sessions, for example, matters involving personnel, cannot be made during public input. And you just click on the link at the top of the agenda to submit your public input tonight. So I will, Sue, I, I think we might have some public input. I had I had <laughs> been having some questions from people about how to do that. So I did um, try to publicize that link a little bit. So and and job well done, Denise. A job well done. <laughs> Excellent. Like we have a little bit of public input tonight. Okay. We have 23 um, folks to hear from. Okay. And some of them are quite lengthy. So I'm going to just read them as is because we don't really have an option. Um, in the in a typical public input when we're in person, um, if things are repeated, we ask people not to continue. That's not really an option when you have um, the written. So I'm just gonna I'm just gonna read verbatim, okay? Oh, that that is true, and I think that's fine. But my recollection is that when we first went remote and we were having 40, 50 public input statements, there were you know, you did go through them all, but I think if there were a lot that were exactly the same, I think we were, you know, but no, I mean, you're right. I think you did read them all. Well, so, and, think, and we want to hear them, honestly, we, we right. want to hear them. Right. And there, everybody has their own story. So, um, here we go. Um, so our first public input is from Barb Marzoli from Berwick. Um, hi, I am a parent of an eighth grader and a senior this year. It is my opinion and the opinion of many other parents I've spoken to that we need to get our kids back to school for more in-person learning for what is left for the rest of the year. Can we not get creative? Once it gets warmer, can we not have outdoor classes? Can we not utilize all of our spaces throughout the district? Our state supplies guidelines, which our district is following. However, they are just guidelines and are not the law. There is room for flexibility in how we do things. Other surrounding districts and private schools are succeeding in doing this. Our teenagers are suffering, not being in school, both emotionally, physically, and socially. I see this firsthand, and it makes me extremely angry that our district does not seem to be taking into that into account. I have a senior that has lost his entire senior year and all the rites of passage that all of our seniors are missing out on. I truly hope that as a board, you can work together with each other and all of the powers that be to create a way to end the school year in a positive way for our teenagers. Thank you, Barb Marzoli. Uh, the next one is from Tracy Golette from North Berwick. Um, and I, I want to share if I mispronounce the name, I totally apologize, but I'm gonna I do the best I can. To the MSED 60 school board and administrators, thank you for the opportunity to share my concerns related to the hybrid learning schedule for the older children in our district. I have increased concerns each day as to how our children are getting their academic needs met when I see other districts offering four and five day in-person class instruction, my ninth grade son has only one day of in-person learning. Two days of remote learning, if on a good day, which lasts four hours each day on a good day, and two days of no schoolwork at all. What worries me even more is the emotional damage that this schedule is having on a developmental age group that has shown a rise in suicide rates prior to the pandemic. According to the CDC, quote, suicide is the second leading cause of death among young people aged 10 to 24. The effects of isolation are heightening this trend. The closure of schools and other social meeting spots youth normally frequent has forced students to stay confined to their homes, increasing the rates of anxiety, depression, and suicidal thoughts for people of this age group, end quote. 
Working at a healthcare facility, one thing that has stood out for me during the pandemic is that the news, the news media has clearly articulated the data related to the confirmed number of COVID cases and related deaths. However, there is no mention of the alarming rates of children slash adolescents visiting the emergency room related to unmet mental health needs. The latest data from the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services states that more than 40% of females and 20% of males in grades 9 through 12 reported that they felt sad or hopeless almost every day over a two-week period, with 22% of females and 12% of males reporting suicidal thoughts. More than 13% of students aged 12 to 17 reported at least one major depressive episode during the past year. Our youth are at a very vulnerable turning point in their lives, one that requires in-person interactions and support following universal COVID precautions and from their peers, teachers, sports coaches, guidance counselors as they navigate complex emotions and relationships. What I would like to ask you is, as a district, are we willing to sacrifice the psychological well-being of our children and continue the hybrid learning schedule that is being offered? We must do best as a community for our children. Uh, the next one is from, let's see if I can do this without, sorry. This is from Abby Asciola from Lebanon. The Noble School District has done a great job shifting locations and transportation in order to allow the elementary level students to attend school in person. Sadly, in order for this to happen, the middle and high school students have had to sacrifice their own access to learning. It is more than halfway through the school year, and I believe that it is only fair that the older students also be given the opportunity to have more in-person learning days. The sacrifices need to be distributed more equitably in order to provide equal access to a quality education. It is my belief that both the middle and high school should increase the number of days that meet for in-person classes. Science has proven that schools were not super spreader epicenters. As, <clears throat> as such, teachers do not need to be vaccinated before returning to school or before returning to the classroom. Please note that I'm not being heartless or cruel. These are simply the scientific facts. I'm a high school teacher myself, and I've been teaching in person without a vaccine since September. Um, we've only had to go remote for a total of six days all year. My students' desks are three to four feet apart. Everyone wears a mask, and all students help to sanitize the surfaces and objects they touch. My point is that it can be done. We just need to recognize as a community that our older students are suffering and they've sacrificed enough. Just because the older students can learn remotely doesn't mean that they should. And let's face it, many of them can't. It's time that we acknowledge the importance of in-person learning for our middle and high school students, not just those in elementary school. Please take, take the time to consider changes to the current hybrid model in order to support the needs of all students in North Berwick, Berwick, and Lebanon. Thank you. All right. Uh, and this, um, the next one is from Sean Winston from Berwick. And what I'll do, folks, too, is I'll make sure that you have um, like access to all the public input so you can look at it later if you want to, because I know that it's sometimes hard to just hear it. Um, dear administration and school board members, I'm writing to voice my frustration as a parent with the current situation regarding the education of my son in the Noble School District. I understood the need to shift to remote learning last spring as the pandemic began, and there are many unknowns about how the virus could be spread. Since that time, we have remained in remote learning at the high school level, and I'm not sure that it is necessary at this point. We now have information on how to mitigate the spread of the virus and manage the risk associated with that. By remaining at the current remote learning model, the school district is failing our children. My son did not have a math class for a year. That is not acceptable. He started the 2020 fall semester with two classes a day and began each Monday morning with essentially a study hall. Thankfully, that has changed, and now they are having four classes instead of just two, but this remains only two days a week with one day in person and still two days with nothing. If we had enough teachers to have a full five-day a week in-person schedule before the pandemic, why do we not have a full schedule five days a week for remote learning? Did we lose staff? I could understand a reduced schedule last spring when this was an unplanned event, but the district had all summer to plan for this school year, and it continues to feel like we're dealing with the same unplanned event. What is the plan for reopening the schools for full-time in-person learning? COVID-19 is not going to go away 100%. We cannot hide from this. There is a risk associated with in-person learning, but we know enough about the virus that these risks can be mitigated using proper procedures outlined by the CDC. Our younger students are in school four days a week. What is the positive case rate among those students? What is the case rate among the high school population? Many high school students work and are out in the public. They are not staying home, holed up in their bedrooms. 
you wash your hands, sanitize and wear a mask and we can function as a community. I know people who live in Brooklyn, New Hampshire, their high school age children are in class five days a week. Hollis Brookline High School is a Hillsborough County, is in Hillsborough County. Hillsborough County, New Hampshire has a case rate of 4.5%. York County has a case rate of 4.5%. After February vacation, they will have two weeks of remote learning in the event someone travels for vacation. This is risk mitigation. How long does Noble wait? Do we wait until we lose a student like they did in Bangor? This should have been a wake-up call for the entire state, yet nothing has changed. The format needs to start shifting back to normal. And don't tell me this is the new normal. Can we get them back in the classroom two days a week or three days a week? This would be much better than one day a week in person. Again, what is the plan? Please don't wait for the state government to make the plan for you. The school administration and the school board have the power to make this change. Respect, respectfully, Sean Winston. Okay, uh, the next one is from Mike Barker from North Berwick. School should be open five days a week, normal schedule. We need to get our kids back in the classroom. The year is almost over, so it might not be wise to shift things for the remainder of the year, but the, but the only plan for fall should be a normal operating plan. Uh, Vicki Dumont from North Berwick. Hopeful the plan is in place to return these kids back to school five days a week, even if it is in April, they need to be in school. Uh, Danielle Libby of Lebanon. Our family has been had been very happy and appreciative of all the work that the school has done. We feel that the hybrid schedule has been perfect. Alyssa Wiswell, North Berwick. These kids desperately need normal back. School, sports, prom, graduation. Someone needs to have the courage to step up for the kids and do what's right. Beth Gisharu from Berwick. I'm curious about what the discussions are on getting the high school students back in school more. I have a ninth and 11th grader. Thank you. All right, hold on now. Uh, Rachel Buddy from Berwick. Although I feel our district has done a good job during these times, I feel it's time for our district to advocate for more in-school time for freshmen, sophomores, juniors, and seniors, as well as to start to allow some attendance of fans for home athletic events. I feel that allowing two, per, two people per athlete masked and social distance from others at athletic events is allowable. All right, Sarah Cesario from North Berwick. In addition to considering all of the impossible state regulations, please consider that in order to be even remotely competitive in the college application and acceptance process, high school students simply need more in-person instruction. Amanda Turner, Lebanon. Um, please put these kids back in school full time. Too many kids have had so much taken from them. This is why so many are depressed and withdrawn. I can't stress enough how these kids need regu a regular school schedule. Owen Sear of Lebanon. I would like it if we could be in school full time again. Being there only one day a week is hurting how we, how, how, and, and how much we learn. Denise Smith from Berwick. Good evening and thank you for your continued service to our community and students during this difficult time. I just wanna take a few minutes and relay my hopes that our high school students will soon be able to resume a more pre-COVID normal schedule. I know this is not new news, but our teens are suffering and they are being tough about it. But I see sadness in my kids' eyes that breaks my heart. As ever, we continue to keep them connected in any way possible, but these kids, um, form connections not only to their peers, but also their teachers, cafeteria staff, coaches, admin, and even a familiar connection within within the building. Gosh, they need this so much. It is what is already such a it is already what is such a turbulent time. Teenagers trying to navigate the flow into early adulthood. Please consider their mental and physical health in your decisions. Not that you haven't, but there must be some triage management in deciding how to organize the situation. And I feel as though the high schoolers have somehow been deemed the population that would be affected the least in all of this. Hence the reason they are only going, getting one day a week of in-person school. If I'm incorrect, I would gladly hear the other explanations. And building juggling has happened within all other grade levels. And thus no juggling to accommodate the high school speaks volumes to me. My other thought is pertaining to seniors and graduation slash prom. If the school has a plan, it needs to be known so that we can all decide as private citizens to move our own direction if we are not going to be able to count on the school to make a move. These seniors have been at such a disadvantage this year on so many levels. And as parents, if the school isn't prepared to or is too restricted by the state, we will take these once in a lifetime events on our own. 
Thank you for the opportunity to present my view. Again, I fully appreciate the positions you are in and your continued service to our communities and students. I need a drink, sorry. Joe Pierce of Lebanon, our children need to get back to school. There is more harm than good happening with these ridiculous COVID policies. Reagan Toof of Lebanon, although not ideal for working parents, I believe the current system is working for my children. Granted, they range from grades second through seventh, so I'm sure our experience is different than those with high school students going only one day a week. If the decision is made to open the schools up further, I implore you to keep the um, noble online learning program running. It has been so crucial to my second graders' education for this semester. Oops, hold on. I got a little away from myself here. Uh, Regina, where are you? There we go. Deanna Santiago from Berwick would love to have my children back in school and able to play sports. They are missing out on so many things. Elizabeth Flowers of Berwick. On remote days, my student completes their virtual learning slash screen time with a teacher by 11.30 a.m. and often earlier. Teaching is ending before noon. I understand that last spring everyone was unprepared for remote learning. I expected when school started in the fall that my student would be online virtual learning with a teacher for most, if not all, of the regular school day. Teachers are not providing enough independent work to keep my student busy for the remainder of the school day. Lisa Davis of Berwick. I do not know if there could reasonably be any changes at this point in time, but I would like to express how awful I feel it is that my two high school kids only go to school for one, one day a week and two days online. They are missing two full days of school per week and essentially getting approximately a half year worth of education this year. My junior is very upset that he's only getting one day in school per week, and my freshman is playing video games all day due to not being in school. I also feel it's particularly unfair that the eighth graders got more schooling or get more schooling. Okay, Kathy Sheedy of Berwick. I know many residents of MS86 here are anxious to have their children return to full-time back to school. While I would love for my student to attend more in-person learning, I worry about those teachers and staff who will need to be in-person as well. Also, I wonder how it would even be possible logistically and meet guidelines for spacing students apart. I would support continuing the current hybrid model until teachers and staff have been able to get vaccinated. I do think that students should be allowed to play sports. Many schools have shown that sports can be played safely, and I think it is necessary to allow these kids the ability to play. Thank you for all your hard work this year, keeping the students and staff safe. All righty. I think, hold on, I've got, got three more. Uh, this is Walt Golette from Northbrook, I believe. Hold on, I gotta get to the end here. Oh. Okay, to the MSED 60 school board and administrators. Hello everyone, I trust you are well and my hope is to, is so, my and my hope is so too are your family and, fr and friends. To say 2020 and now 2021 have been a bit disrupted is an understatement. Back in the spring of 2020, we were thrown into chaos as the unknowns of this virus began to multiply. With respect to education, public, private, and higher institutions of learning were forced to close and transition in-person learning to fully remote classes. While this worked in some sense for a lot of families, issues with the remote access, not to mention the cumulative effects on the social and emotional toll that distance learning brings with it, have come to fruition. A full year into this model and the data from across the country is continuing to show that this generation of young people are shouldering a burden their mind and bodies were never meant to bear. Anxiety, depression, social, social isolation, fear, restlessness, and anger, all up in some instances by more than 30%. Stress within the family unit as parents work to balance their careers with helping their children with schoolwork at home is even is higher than ever. I see this same thing even with our undergraduate and graduate students who are much more independent, socially and emotionally mature than their younger counterparts in our K-12 education system. The pandemic, the pandemic hasn't spared anyone, even those who never became infected. Like many parents in this community and communities across the country, we are witnessing with our own eyes the heavy toll this is taking on our education system and the children that rely on it. That, by the way, includes what our teachers have been dealing with too. It's truly heartbreaking to see these changes in our kids, and I must emphasize we need to become more creative and think outside the box on how to change this model. 
While there appears to be light at the end of the tunnel, we may not close that gap anytime soon and thus need to plan accordingly. While the transition to remote learning has been and continues to be challenging, it does offer our children some educational experience, albeit not ideal. However, the SAD 60 transition to remote learning has been and continues to be challenging. It does offer our children, oh, hold on, I'm sorry. <laughs> However, the MSAD 60 model in its current form is not a sufficient substitute. When we transitioned to a remote learning model, my assumption was we would do so in its entirety. This is what would have normally transpired in school via in-person, um, would now take place in virtual setting with the same format, more or less. What our olders, grade nine through 12, students experienced thus far is, in my opinion, grossly deficient. For the first several months of the school year, my child has had two 50-minute classes in the morning on Monday and Tuesday, nothing a remainder of those days, followed by no school on Wednesdays, in person on Thursday, and nothing on Friday. I have written to the administration and the board expressing my concern months ago, and I will acknowledge some movement that began at the November meeting to discuss to increase class load. The outcome from that meeting were promising in that two classes were added to the Monday and Tuesday afternoon schedule. Unfortunately, my child still has no classes on Wednesday or Friday. That's 40% of the week with nothing. If you add up the time my child is currently attending class, in person or remote, I estimate maybe 16 hours is class time total. How is that acceptable? Back of the envelope calculation here, but I'm thinking that more than six months at minimum, my child is getting less than 50% of their state required education time. I'm estimating, but you get the idea. How does such a low benchmark even come close to meeting academic slash state standards or help to prepare them for the next level? I continue to be confused why a regular full day, albeit remote day, isn't in effect. That is, students have all the same classes they normally would each day, and they have class every day of the week for the full time. There are several challenges to a truncated week, not the least of which is teachers trying to fit a semester's worth of material into 60% or less of the normal time they'd have to do it. This places undue stress on the teachers to reach those education milestones, and worse yet, students are being expected <coughs> to keep up with the, what, that workload. This is putting undue stress on both parties. There is also in inequity across districts, Oops, hold on, with respect to how much time is devoted to in-person or even online learning. There seems to be many examples of school districts, public and private, that are, um, I'm sorry, this is a long one, so I'm getting, I'm getting lost in a little bit. Um, <sighs> seems to be many examples of public and private that are doing full-time remote with their older students, a more complete hybrid where the older students are in person more than one day per week or full-time in person for the older students. Yet we appear stuck in the same model, more or less. We've been in since spring. Why? Framed another way, if by some miracle we could go full in the, in the technology we have at our disposal, oh man, <laughs> if by some miracle we could go full in in person beginning next week, would we not have the teachers in place to make this happen? Why is it so different? And why are we looking at approximately 40% of the week off when the technology we have at our disposal is the best it has ever been to do remote learning? We should be able to accommodate higher, not lower class loads. I am aware you face many logistical challenges, especially as they relate to spacing, moving the younger kids up to the larger schools and other issues you need to conform with. This has certainly benefited the younger students and as a parent of a younger child, those efforts are certainly appreciated. That said, these older students are suffering on many levels. They need these interactions with their teachers, a time, oh my goodness, I'm <laughs> sorry. Uh, they need these interactions with their teachers, a time to interact with them, their peers, socialize even distantly, and a full class time each day. I mentioned this above, but the data on the isolation effect is staggering. Moving forward, we need to begin discussing plans. Rates are dropping, vaccines are making their way through the governor's tiered systems and teachers are now prioritized. I do hope the board can use this meeting and feedback to present ideas on how to improve the current model and provide more opportunity for our children. Getting them implemented ASAP should be the priority. I would like to thank you for the efforts you have put in thus far. I know there has been a lot of work to date. Logistics are challenging, but we need to adapt our education model. Thank you for your time and I look forward to the ideas brought forward from these discussions. Okay. Um, Melina Mansfield of North Berwick, kids need to go back to school. Carrie Laughlin of Lebanon, kids need to be back in school full time. Remote should be offered to those afraid to return their kids. 
And our last one, Kate Sheldon of Berwick. I am fearful there may be pressure to resume in-person learning too quickly. It will take time to get all teachers vaccinated. Then homerooms and classes will need to be adjusted. In my opinion, the current setup is fine until the end of the year. We can resume in-person learning in September. Okay, so I apologize to anybody out there that as, as I was reading, they were really long and I did, um, I did lose my place a couple of times. I hadn't pre-read these because I thought it would be better to just read them as is. And so there we go. So that's the full gamut of your public input for this part of the evening. And I think Audra has something she wants to share. And we'll go from there. Um, I the public input. I just, for anybody that might be listening, I do want to say thank you because I, I know that sometimes people aren't sure if they have the ear of the board and administration. So I'm, I personally am very grateful that people take the time to let us know what their situation is. So. And I, and I think that's basically what I was going to say, Denise, that I want to assure everyone that we've heard and we feel that our ultimate goal is to, the same, and that's to get our students back to school in person as safely as we possibly can. Um, I have a senior in high school in a different school district, and I share the concerns that were expressed tonight, and I share the frustrations, but I also know that as a district, we've done a really great job integrating and following the requirements for health and safety. Um, and so I, you know, I, I see, I see it all on, on all ends of that spectrum. Uh, we do have a board um, session, a work session scheduled for March 18th, when we will be discussing the ways that we've in already um, increased in person learning for students and ways that we can um, look at increasing it uh, in a more targeted manner moving ahead as well. So we will, as I said, be addressing that on the 18th of March in that work session. And that isn't it, that's an agenda item to go into a little bit more detail on, right? Are we on? Well, we that that was yeah. pretty much just gonna cover that, but because it came up in public. Um, input, we can yeah, I think when we get to that point of the agenda, I'd love to have a little bit more discussion about that. Um, okay, do we have a student um, report to see her? Right. Okay. Um, all right, minutes of February 18th. I did not see any issues, but there's better proofreaders out there. I didn't see any problems. Anyone want to make a motion to accept those minutes? I make motion to accept the minutes of the last meeting. I'll second them. That's Nancy. This is Nancy. All right. All in favor? Can never tell if I can see everyone. One, two. Can you see me? Right there. Can I see who? This is Estrada. Can you see me? Because my yeah. computer's my uh, camera icon is red, which it isn't usually. No, I, yeah, we can see and hear you. Okay. So. Okay. I'd um, like to abstain, Denise. This is Joanne. Okay. Yeah. I'd like to abstain. Yeah. Uh, okay. Donation to the backpack program. And yes, Stephanie, I did just hear you. <laughs> we, we were just uh, confirming who made the uh, original motion. So we, I think we've got it. It was Rebecca, correct? Rebecca. <laughs> and Stephanie and Joanne abstain. Thank you. Um, we have a donation of $700 to the backpack program from the Anton Razanoff family. Wow. Yep. We have to make a motion to accept that one, right? Yes, we do. I'll make a motion to accept that with uh, appreciation. This is Joanne. I'll second that. All right. All in favor? 
Um, all right, educational programming update. Sure, so we just wanted to focus a little bit on attendance um, this time because the bulk of this meeting we're using to um, do the budget presentation, the original budget, uh, the official budget presentation. So um, for our students this week, we had, um, well, actually it was last week because we didn't have a meeting last week. So we had 90 to 90, 90 was our low of student attendance, 98 was our high. Um, for this week, however, we had a low of 75%, and that was due to the power outage that we had in uh, Lebanon on Tuesday. Um, so that was our lowest um, number of students' attendance, uh, and the highest number was 98%. And again, that was only that one day um, when we did have Tuesday power outage in Lebanon. For our staff, this um, last couple of weeks, we've ranged 95 to 97% in attendance. So that is uh, in line with um, what we've been seeing. And those were the, uh, this, the educational updates for the, these past couple of weeks. Okay. And facilities use? Sure, we um, are getting, and this is uh, a part that we wanted to discuss because we've been receiving some requests to use facilities, the outside facilities as well as the inside of our facilities. Um, one of the concerns with the inside of the facilities is we have to sanitize uh, very carefully after the fact. So we just wanted to talk with the board to get the sense of um, peace for that. Um, because sometimes we do not, you know, depending on what group it is, we don't charge fees. But if we have to have our custodial staff come in over the weekend to do some sanitizing, that will um, cause some fees for some of the, the groups. We also wanted to talk about, um, there's like at our high school, we have a lot of use um, from outside the state sometimes comes in like for the um, gymnastics or dance um, things and we just wanted to talk about that. That that to me is an easier kind of discussion following the health and safety guidelines. Um, but just your overall sense about using the tracks, using the fields, using the indoor spaces. So I have a question. I guess it would probably be more for indoor, but it, it could be for either. Um, if a group did not follow the guidelines, do we have any liability for that? I'm thinking on that one. Yeah. 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 It's at some level. Um, can you hear me? Okay. No. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the responsibility is on the group of people that are utilizing the facilities, but it's, you know, we're always going to be that secondary piece, right? There's always the potential that we would be, well, you guys didn't enforce the rules upon the people that are like utilizing the space. So it's something to think about. I mean, I think I feel a lot more comfortable with the idea of using the outside facilities. Um, I definitely agree that if there was something inside, it would, there should be a fee, for a cleaning fee. Um, but I, I don't know. I, I don't. I will be completely honest that I'm struggling with the idea of allowing outside groups to participate in events at the school when our own children are not. And I don't, that's like just, I don't know if that's a juvenile response to it, <laughs> but I, um, I don't know. What do other people think? Playing a little bit of devil's advocate on that, Denise. A lot of these folks that are asking to utilize the facilities are people that are working with our students, right? Or work like dance and things like that. So there's a piece of opening up the doors a little bit to our kids to have a little bit more social interaction if we do allow that space. But it is, it's absolutely a double-edged sword, right? Like, and, and are they, like, if there was a dance thing, are there 
like our parents allowed and or are they following the same guidelines that we would have for sports we have to follow the same the, the state guidelines right so the gatherings inside couldn't be more than a certain number um so it, it, again it's, it is very much like a double-edged piece that we are that we are talking about right now so i don't have a really good answer for you honestly like we're 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 basically stating we're trying to very much limit um, spectators, and these kind of um, opportunities might not limit it as significantly as we do. But they could they would still have to meet the state guidelines. Yeah. yeah. So the state guidelines, though, for those community organizations, are different than the state guidelines for your school organizations. Um, yeah. So like community organizations that my kids were a part of over the summer, we were able to have fans right. in attendance as long as we stayed within the, I think it was like 100 at that time, mm -hmm. person limit. And it was 100 per field, not 100 for the site. Right. So. Yeah. So again, we're living in, it's like we have these different um, rules that we have to follow. <laughs> complicated and audra are you looking for the board to give you a thumbs up or a thumbs down or like just feedback what do you what do you need from us i think i would like uh, like a thumbs up or a thumbs down on this because i think you're going to hear regardless of how we go i think you may be the ones that get some feedback um so really the conversation and and what we decide to do i think would be helpful <laughs> I mean, what I would like to see is that as a school, we move towards allowing activities. Um, you know, I would say that any outside group, I 100% think that there's an impact on cleaning and there should be, you know, something to cover that. I don't personally have an issue with outdoor activities and I guess I don't know what do other people think about indoor if they're still if they are following the state guidelines i i almost want to, we need to come up with some kind of form or something saying these are the guidelines if someone comes and checks on your group and you're not following them you're shut down immediately and you have to leave or something i don't know you got to come up with some document that it and we have to come up with a fee how much of a cleaning fee what would it cost? We already Could, do, we do have some documents, but you are correct, Nancy. They don't um, because we haven't used it this year. They don't incorporate the health and safety guidelines and, and right. all those pieces. But we do already have a fee schedule um, that we have used. But does it include extra cleaning, or is that just the regular? Just well, we would tack on time. Hmm. Yeah, if it took two hours instead of one hour or four hours instead of two, right. we would just, uh, reflect that in the charge. Okay. What if we allowed uh, gatherings, but in a way that did meet this way the school would approach them? So my only question for you is who is monitoring that? Right. Like who's going to come out on a Saturday and make sure that, so it's, there's a lot of just, there's a lot of dynamics that we need to think about, but wanting to open, like I, I totally wouldn't mind being able to let kids use the track again and do the thing. Like, we, remember, we at one point we shut down all of our fields and we haven't allowed recreational use of our fields. Um, so that this is that, this is that kind of conversation. And we are moving it to a better place, I think. So. Maybe this is how we open our doors, right? A little bit more. I would like to allow use of the fields. So maybe we just take take a pulse right now on that, or is there further discussion on the fields? Like, is that an easier one to start right now to talk about right now? Yeah, I I would be okay with outdoor anything outdoors, um, but not indoors until everybody is is able to get. 
Are, are there uh, bathroom facilities available for people if they're using the fields? That would be a concern of, about also having um, extra money put in there for those uh, facilities to be cleaned. Yeah, because those were locked to, I would agree. That's a good point because we do have them. They just were locked last year. But I, but if you have an event, I would think yeah, exactly. you'd have to have uh, facilities available for people that were there. But I, I you know, I, th I think it will go a long way for the community if uh, we do allow um, people to start using the fields again. I think that would be um, a wonderful thing for the students. Um, that belong to these outside groups to have an opportunity to get out and play some ball. Could we maybe do draft a sort of an agreement slash policy to review at the next meeting that would cover indoor stuff and see if we can get the wording in a way that we're comfortable? Yes, we can do that. And I think it would make sense if we all... Um, if we met with Kevin and the other the maintenance folks and the some of the coaching just just pull together our administrative team to talk about this because each of our buildings have fields. And so each of our principals have some level of responsibility to those fields. Um, and then to the public to make sure like there's a whole scheduling piece that goes with this, you know. So um, I think we need to talk. Here, but we wanted to ask first and find out if you were interested in us sort of going in that direction. I, I would be interested in going in that direction. I, I think the community needs it. I, yeah. I, I would agree. I just, are we going to have people that will be willing, even if we pay them, to come in on the weekends and clean? Uh, you know what I mean? <laughs> That's something I think facilities can tell us when you talk to them is, do you have the staff and how much is it going to cost? What are the additional time frames yep. for each event? Because if, if we don't have that, then we can't even offer it. But right. I, I agree. I think we should definitely, if we can, offer it. Same here. I agree with uh, outdoor. That sounds great if we can make it happen. Um, I want to think a little bit more about the, the indoor, though. I would maybe if we can. I don't have any problem with the outside use. I do think we need to think a little bit more about requirements for the indoor use. Yeah, I I think also, we could just get like a draft policy for indoor that we can all review maybe next week because I'm sure people are going to want an answer sooner rather than later. Sorry, Chad. We'll be able to get it together for next week just because it's a board workshop next week for the budget, but maybe the following, we can try to pull it together to give us two weeks. That might help. We got to put, who's our, who's our policy committee? Estrita. Estrita and, and Stephanie. Stephanie. All right, we got, we got a little work to do. So I also agree with the outdoors being uh, good to go. Uh, I'd love to see the indoors as well, but I understand we there's some more work that we got to do there. But I'm good, good to go with both of them. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you for that direction. We are getting some increased calls, um, particularly right now about use of the track. Um, and there was one question from somebody from Massachusetts using the high school building, and we felt very comfortable saying no at that point. Um, okay, so I did for the for the March eighteenth workshop. I did want to just um, make sure that we that the board had a clear understanding of what the goal of that is. So, and also just to be clear, it's, we don't have anything next week. The workshop is two weeks from now. I think I got my dates wrong. The no. budget, we're having a budget workshop, March 11th, which is next Thursday. And oh, that, that's why I was confused. Okay. That will be with um, cost centers. Uh, tonight is just the overview of the budget. 
Next week will be the, the cost center, um, okay. the time when you can meet with each cost center and have a larger board discussion about the budget. And then the following week on the 18th is the work session for okay. um, talking about um, the hybrid plan, especially okay. for the upper grade levels. Okay, so can you, um, I, yeah, I would like to, well, I don't know which way to phrase this. So um, I guess I would like to hear from you what you think the goal of the 18th workshop is and what what you would like to have as a result of that. I believe our goals are to um, continue to share with you what we've done to increase in uh, in-person learning for our upper levels. Uh, we also talked about when we started um, way back in July and August in planning, we said that we would come and provide updates to the board. So we had an update a few months ago when right before we made some shifts uh, mm -hmm. to the high school schedule, we're prepared to come with another update to share um, our thoughts at this point in time. We did just receive information as you um, know about the fact that um, teaching, teachers and staff and vaccinations. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. Uh, we're going to talk about, um, honestly, the six health and safety guidelines and how the board feels about them um, overall, but also in particular, the social distancing, because the social distancing is three, six, three feet to six feet for the state of Maine and um, nationally at six feet. So we we will spend some time talking about that, and then we will hear um, an update from the high school and the middle school um, administration on how things are going currently, and any um, opportunities for increased person uh, in person learning. Those are our goals. Okay. Um, so I think that all sounds great. Um, my concern is that. Well, it, it sounds great as an update. Um, I, I would like to sort of, I guess, th have a throw out to the board to see what support there is. But I, I would like to propose that at that workshop, we be presented with a plan to, to get the ninth through 12th graders in school significantly more. So I don't know what that means as far as the number of days, but it's the, the two, and we just heard this from input, but it's been clear all along that the two biggest issues are number of hours of education and of just learning period, and then number of days in with actual face time. So I'm not sure, you know, I don't necessarily think that adding two more remote days is gonna be the answer. Um, but I, I think some combination, I know that transportation is an extremely difficult thing to figure out. Um, but I guess I would like to, that's the, what I would propose to see what, if the rest of the board, I mean, obviously this isn't something we're voting on, but I, I would like to have a part of that agenda be a proposal because we're, you know, that's March 18th, and then can I can I interrupt for a second today? Because I I totally understand the frustration that people have. I mean, you you heard it clearly in the in the public input on that 18th. I don't know that we're going to be able to present you with a proposal yet. There are things that the board needs to decide together. We'd like to give you an overview and an understanding of where we are, why we are here, what that means in terms of, um, of like putting together more in-person time and how that will impact different, different grade levels. So we, we want to just give you some time with the administrative team as they've been working through all of this and to have you guys participate in some of that and also be able to um, help us make some decisions about current um, standards, like the three foot versus the six foot, that kind of thing. We need you um, to hear all that, and we're happy to have that conversation with you together. Then I think you can give us that charge, um, but we really do need the input from the board 
in a in a very um I, I just did an open conversation is what yeah, I'm hoping for. I agree with that. I, you know, this, this semester, we had agreed to revisit this after the first semester, which was mid-January. And by the time we have that meeting and then time to think it over, it's, I mean, right now there's three months left of school and then there'll be two. And then at what point does it become totally pointless? Like, you know, we're not just hearing from people tonight this these are comments that as a board we've been hearing for a while and it's we now know that teachers are going to get vaccinated and that was a huge burden so my my concern is not that we don't all want the same thing but i don't how how much time do we need to i mean is this something that we can it's it's not it's, it's, not, it's, it's, not, it's what it's not a quick turnaround to figure this, to be perfectly honest with you, to figure it all out. You're right. It's not well, a quick we should have been, You know, we, I know we can't go back now, but like we should have been ready to do this at the end of the first semester when we had agreed to do it. So if I understand it's not a quick turnaround, but how, like how long does it take after the 18th? And it sounds, you know, when you, when Audrey, you said, opportunities for more targeted in person that phrase kind of concerned me a little bit i don't know how you're going to target but they everybody needs it they all need it and i um so I, to be honest it's like i i can't even really talk it like it's it it's emotional it, it's emotional i get it i we get it i think we all get it i think that to come up with something. So I want to echo what Denise is saying. I completely agree with what she's saying, and I have her same frustrations. Mm -hmm. And I think part of it has to do with the fact that we have kids in school, and we're dealing with it in a way more event as as well outside of this outside of this board. My hope for that 18th meeting was the same as Denise's. That I was hoping you guys were going to come with us to all right. Let's discuss some of these options, and some of these options we're going to be. If we go this way, let's do this. If we go that way, let's do this. We've already discussed all this, you know, the, the pros and the cons of everything that we've had. I think it's time to start moving forward on, you know, how do we get these kids in there and let's go. Yeah, is there, is there a partial meeting that we could have prior to the 18th? You know, is there some piece of this work that's already in process that we can discuss adding? You know, I think people would, I assume the board is willing to sort of, I think we want to put in the extra time to see what the options are. I, I'm just worried about timing, but I mean, yeah, like Travis said, my, I was hoping that originally I was hoping when I asked to have it on the agenda, I was hoping that we would be talking about stuff tonight. It's two weeks from now. And then after that, we need time to ponder, you know, I don't, I, I don't, I think that's too. Okay. I don't think we have that time. I don't think they have that time. I feel like we might be able to come to it a little bit quicker if you just try to look at it uh, between two different points of view of are we going to do we want to get more in person time or do we want to get more educational time? If you look at it like that, it might be easier to move forward in terms of if we're trying to get more in person time, then we have to look at it differently. But if we're trying to get more school time, then maybe something like that could be uh, where we're switching to more of a remote mode, which I know goes against the in-person, but it would give more educational hours and, and more of a heavy workload, vice not. And then if we're trying to get in person, you know, then it becomes a little bit more of a balancing act. And then maybe we look at, okay, the seniors uh, should have priority because they'll be leaving, you know, soon and, and they won't have next year to try to make up for it. So just my, my personal point of view is if we can figure out which side it is that we want to try to move towards. I think it might be easier uh, to come up with a solution. Yeah, one other thought is what what is the date of the end of this quarter? Uh, it's, it's, we'll look it up. So, so one suggestion is to for us to commit to coming up with a plan for the fourth quarter. And that would make it easier from a like scheduling of classes standpoint. Um, I have one other, we, April 2nd is the end of the third 
quarter. Um, how do you guys feel about the, so the distancing guideline? That's really our biggest bugaboo. I say three feet. If, if, and I may know it doesn't answer all the questions. I agree, three feet. Get these kids in school. Now, maybe this is my bad and I was sleeping, but I did not realize that some of the high school kids are only in school one, one day a week. They're, all, they're all in school it's one all, day a week. Yeah, they've all, all been in. All two weeks, two days a week. No. Okay, so now I'm not, now I'm not happy. <laughs> no, but, right. And then, so, yeah, yeah, so I. I that much, my bad, but that's not acceptable. I think I mean, that you know, in with vaccinations and being able to open windows and maybe have some of the outdoor structures, I feel like all of that together, um, you know, I, I'm okay going with the three feet, four feet, whatever. I don't know how it gets. Well, sort of three feet will make, will make a big difference for us. It will not answer all of the questions, but it'll answer a lot of the questions. So. Um, we can take that information and go forward because that really was that's that's a big piece of the of the puzzle for us. It's a huge piece. Has can we the ventilation yeah. been improved? Yeah. What's I'm that? Sorry, Rebecca. Sorry, I was just going to say, ha have haven't you guys um, spent some money on improving ventilation also? Yeah. So we're in good, we're in good shape ventilation wise. Factors yeah. into it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So will the three feet affect the busing? Do they have to say you know? Can yeah. they see? Kids on the bus. That's mm -hmm. a whole. That's a whole other little kettle of, kettle of fish that we'll have to chase down, because currently the standards are such that we're supposed to be. I think what? How many kids can we get on a bus? Twenty four, I think, um, on a seventy two passenger bus. So it could. Those are all things that we have to jump into. So we will do that. We will do that if we have the um, the the approval of the board to go to three feet. Yeah, that, I don't know how everybody feels, so. Yeah, I'd like to hear from everybody. I don't know if this is something we need to just do a straw poll on or an actual vote, but can we at least make sure, I think, Estrita, Linda, Lynn, maybe, we haven't heard from, or Joanne, I'm not sure. Well, I think three feet, I'd, I'd like to see us move to three feet. I agree, this is Linda, I agree, three feet, get back in as much as we can. Same I'm not here. in favor of three feet. I think that's too close. Um, I think when the younger students only have to be three feet apart, they're going to start forgetting and start touching each other and getting closer than that. So, so just, that's, just that makes a considerable distance, but three feet is only an arm length away. Where it's going to be pretty easy to forget that and get too close. Lynn, just, just for everybody's input or uh, up to date, at the elementary level, we do about it's a four foot distance because they're little bodies and the and the middle and high school, because the kids are all, you know, we treat that as that six foot as the adult. Um, so they're already four foot at the elementary level. So um, the three foot for the upper levels, um, it won't adjust anything at the elementary level, probably. Travis, you have a hand up. Oops, wrong button. Yeah, um, so I think the other thing that um, I'd like to have more of a discussion on is how are they separating in the schools? I know at the high school, we have tons of different pods, and I, I, I would like to think that we could be able to get away with putting the 6th and 7th graders in one pod, the 8th and ninth graders in another pod, and I don't know exactly off the top of my head how many pods we have, but can we divide them into the pods and s submit them that way like we do during a normal school year? So there was a suggestion, I, I just got a text message from one of our administrators who said that they would love to have uh, maybe even that workshop, I haven't figured that piece out yet, a, con a conversation within the high school physically so that you can see how things are rolling, so that you can see what they're doing and how they're doing it, because the middle school and the high school are both here. So we could do that on that workshop day so that you guys could see how our things are and you can give us some, I, you know, if you can give us some feedback on that, and also some of the what of um, what we'll propose, I guess, for, for a shift so that we can move forward. We are all on the same page. Everybody wants the kids back. That is the absolute truth. So we've been working within a certain set of parameters, and um, 
we need to all work together to get to that end goal. Let's treat it. I would like there to be teacher input on this because they're the ones on the front line. We can make all the decisions we want. The teachers are the ones who know what is going on in the classrooms and how the students are likely to respond to a tighter zone. Um, yes, we have we have good news on the horizon with the vaccines. The J and J vaccine is great with the with the just one shot thing and with with Merck going in on the uh, production as well. That's wonderful news. And if the teachers are getting vaccinated, that's fantastic. I will feel much better once the teachers are vaccinated. Um, I'm not worried about the students getting sick at this point as much as I am the staff. And we're, I know that our remit is the students, but we're also, I mean, the students aren't in the school in the vacuum. The teachers are there too. And I think they're exhausted. We all are. I don't know how you guys are still <laughs> on your feet. Um, I just don't want to make what to the teachers might feel like an arbitrary decision without input from from them. Mm -hmm. Rebecca, did you have a comment too? Uh, no, I'm just, you know, look, trying to look at three feet versus six feet thing. I, I'm still kind of confused why the CDC says we need three, six feet and some other experts are saying we only need three, but I, I was going to say that the fact that they've worked on the ventilation and when the weather starts warming up a little bit, maybe we can keep some windows open or I don't know. That, An early know. spring would be lovely. <laughs> yeah. So it's going to be 60 next week, so we're good. <laughs> Ever the optimist, Travis, I love you. <laughs> So, can we agree that on the 18th, we will be able to have a proposal of some sort and question mark? And then I guess I would say if there's a need for a meeting in between now and then, I would, I would certainly request that it, the whole board be able to be available if possible. But I think it's... I think this is just an enormous priority and we are running out of time. So I think, Denise, what I would say again is that we are all, we all want the same thing. And when I said targeted, um, I did not mean two or three students. Uh, our high school and our middle school administration is looking at ways to bring in students, period. Um, and we will certainly have proposals and things for you on that for the 18th, but we also needed to talk about the three feet versus the six feet because that really does impact what and how we can do things moving ahead. So we're all the, to the same thing. Yeah, one, one word that really stuck with me with one of the um, people that wrote in was, you know, we do spend a lot of time as a district talking about um, equitable education amongst our towns. And I really, um, you know, that just thinking of that in terms of education really, um, it just really, it really resonated with me that, um, and we all agreed 100% that the young ones needed to be prioritized. I don't think anyone would disagree with that, but I just, I think that the, like, you know, yes, Travis and I can say this because we see it firsthand. Um, but yeah, this is a move that we need to, to make. And because we have this fabulous remote academy, nobody's going to be forced to do something that they're not comfortable with. So it's, yeah. I agree. That's the added benefit that we can't forget about that at the high school level it's a lot easier to do the remote academy with these kids because they can join right in their regular class just as if they were there. So the parents still have that right of choosing whether they want to send their kid to school or not. It's just whether or not we can fit 6th through 12th in our high school. I don't know if we necessarily could, but I think we need to do our due diligence to make sure we can get as many of them in at a time, as many days as possible, because these kids, 
have been days off during the week and we all know they're doing it, it's completely unacceptable. These kids need to have school Monday through Friday. Um, one more thing that I don't know that we need to cover on the 18th, but we are going to have to talk about it sooner rather than later. Um, so I just want to sort of put it out there. Maybe it can go on the next agenda. But um, I do, I would like us to talk about graduation before graduation talks about us. So um, that's already, those conversations are already happening at the high school. And okay. we will provide you with an update. Okay. And I also know that um, there are some people at the state level that are working on making sure that schools have um exemptions in place so that they can have an outdoor graduation as far as limits of people and whatnot so it's something that they're thinking of at the state level as well we just got the updated guidelines and they don't have that yet so no no i don't think this is official yet i just think i think people are are two days ago actually right. so. yeah no i think that's just there's an effort to make sure that graduation is considered even if it's its own thing Okay, thank you guys for hearing us. We we understand. We really do. Yeah. Should we talk about money? We should talk about money. Not quite yet, is no, it? Yes, it is. <laughs> okay. All right, so we'll move on to the budget. And I have, there's just a lot. So I do have some notes. So if it looks like I'm reading, I definitely am because I've got some notes. <laughs> so first of all, thank you for allowing me to present the superintendent's budget for fiscal year 22. The budget represents 991,628 increased taxpayers, which is equivalent to a 4.79% increase from the fiscal year 21 district budget. Before highlighting the major factors of this increase, I'd like to talk a little bit about our process. In the early fall, cost centers met together. We identified two goals for the budget cycle. The goals focused on social emotional learning and support, as well as our continued work on increasing literacy skills K to 12th grade. From there, the cost centers began to develop budgets, taking into consideration the goals previously identified. The detailed pages on each of the school building cost center budgets addresses the goals through professional development, guidance supplies, instructional supplies, and textbooks. Over the last few months, cost centers and the central office met to review budgetary requests, honing in on the goals while also addressing facilities, capital improvement projects, school nutrition, technology, transportation, and health. As a result of our ongoing cost center meetings, the full budget was compiled and presented to the facilities and finance committee for discussion and review. The original budget was dated 21821 and represented a 6.82% increase to taxpayers. At the facilities and finance committee level, discussion occurred around ways to lower the percent increase of that 6.82%. Due to the fact that the budget was already lean, the committee asked that the cost center budgets be reviewed again, rather than the facilities and finance committee creating a decision sheet at that point in time. The result of the facilities and finance committee meetings and further honing in on each cost center budget, the revised district budget dated 3121 was created. For discussion purposes, please be sure you're referring to the documents dated 3121 at the bottom left hand side. As we delve into this budget, you have a sheet listing some changes that occurred between both drafts. Again, those changes are a result of the decision of the Facilities and Finance Committee to bring an overall percent increase to taxpayers less than the initial 6.82%. A great deal of our board meetings have focused on the impact of COVID-19 in the school setting. The budget has also been impacted as we highlighted a few weeks ago during a financial update. I'll take some time right now to remind the board of those factors. 
Governor Mills notified us in the fall of 2020 that she would refrain from curtailment for fiscal year 21 and instead would curtail funds in the 22 budget so districts had time to plan. As a result, MSAD 60 will not only be losing 367,211 in state subsidy, but we will not receive the fund increase in subsidy, which is typical. Due to the federal mandate that school nutrition projects operate under the summer food summer program, the district is providing meals to all students at no cost. MSAD school nutrition is running at a loss at about $2,000 per day. And under this mandate, we anticipate a $500,000 deficit for fiscal year 22. 102,000 is currently represented in the district bu budget while the remainder of the funds will come from COVID-related grant money. Last July, the voters approved a four, four projects, the sprinkling installation in Lebanon at the Hanson School, Hussey School in North Berwick, and the asbestos abatement at Noble Middle School. For, and that totaled $1.8 million, with the state paying all but $733,000 which will be paid back to the main bank bond over 10 years. When the projects went out to bid, the bid, bids came in $500,000 over the projected $1.8 million. The building committee, facilities and finance committee, and the board sees these projects as necessary, and given the significant state grant funding, agrees it is responsible for MSAD 60 to pay the overage to complete this work. That development, that $500,000 overage is represented in the budget. Major construction projects in the form of additions in all three towns are in the planning phases. The current estimate of $100,000 in payment of engineers and architects for the new project development is also reflected in this budget. Staffing is typically another driving factor in the district budget. We are proposing the addition of the following positions. A kindergarten teacher at North Berwick Elementary School due to projected enrollment. One advanced math teacher at Noble Middle School to be shared between grades six and seven. One and a half teachers at the high school, which were formerly grant funded, but are coming back into the budget. And this is from our multiple pathways program. One permanent sub for special education one part-time bookkeeper to assist with the additional documentation requirements for the federal grants, the SRRF projects, which are the sprinklers and the asbestos abatement, and the up upcoming building projects. Additionally, to the addition to those new positions, we've made some changes or proposed some changes to some current positions. Increase the literacy coach at Hussey School by one day to address ongoing professional development to staff and support and guidance to new teachers in the classroom. Increase the community engagement coordinator 10 hours per week to broaden the scope of the position to include working with students and their families who have chronic attendance issues. Increase point four, a, a point four increase for a school psychological provider. So right now, I'd like to draw your attention to the slides that Sue's going to be presenting. She's right trying. <laughs> Getting excited. Here we go. Can you see it? Okay. So both, so this is the first of two slides. Both slides provide a breakdown of costs. The first slide is the overall budget breakdown. Is there a way you can make that bigger? Uh, I'm squid. Oh, I can, yeah. Can you guys see this okay? Yep. Okay. Okay. As can you see it? Yeah. Okay. So as you can see, our fixed costs, salaries, wages, and benefits is about 85.2% of the entire budget. Yep. Again, those are fixed costs largely driven by contracts and insurance premiums. Go a really helpful view, Audra. Sorry, what did you say? This is a really helpful view. Oh. Okay, good. <laughs> Thank you. If I could read it on the screen. <laughs> hey, I'm doing the best I can. It's, it's my glasses. <laughs> I need glasses. Um, 
going through the remainder of the list, purchase and contracted services is about, it's a 7.6% increase. And that includes like specialty services for heating, um, any kind of like snow removal, those types of any, any, any kind of contracts that we do. That's that um, supplies and books are come in at 4.6%, dues and fees account for 1.4% of the budget. And what's that equipment last? Is the middle one. Equipment is 0.7. Yeah, 0.7%. No, we have the contingency. And the contingency is 0.4%. So again, that's the, the snapshot of our entire budget. Sea of blue. It is a sea of blue. So the next slide just breaks down the um, the salary, wages, and benefits by group. So we have the blue, which is regular education at 45.1%. The red is special education at 21.1%. The yellow gold is student and staff support at 9.7%. The green is other instruction at 2.2, and what this includes is any um, credit recovery programs at the high school, kindergarten jump start, um, and boost at the elementary levels, tutoring, athletics, those um, types of instructional instruction program instructional programs, and then we have system administration at 2.6 percent of the full amount of that budget. And then the last one is school administration, and that's six right, point then, um, six point one. Yeah, transportation. Yeah, thank you. Transportation is six point nine percent, and facilities and maintenance is six point two percent. And I can share this document with you. I will give it to the board. Okay. So if you didn't hear Sue, she said we will be able to share this document, this uh, these two pie charts with you, so that you can have those to see them. But again, we, we really um, were a sea of blue. <laughs> the one thing to keep in mind though, is in, especially in that last slide, is that the number of people in those positions compared to some of the other positions that are smaller right. scale. Right, yep, definitely. So now we'll kind of talk a little bit more about revenue. So moving to the moving estimated revenue for fiscal 22, you'll see an overall revenue that overall revenue is up forty thousand dollars from 20 fiscal year 21. Uh, should we be looking at anything in the binder? You can look at the revenue section right now if if that would help, and that is on tab 22. Thank you. Yeah. Tab 22. Okay. So the revenue is up about $40,000 from fiscal year 21, but the amounts in each category have shifted a little bit, as you can see, if you're looking at your binder. Uh, we will receive the, the $367,211 le less in state subsidy, uh, as I mentioned previously, um, due to the curtailment. Um, we will use more fund balance than we did in 21 to cover the costs of one-time expenses and reduce the impact to taxpayers. The MHA student tuition will increase to reflect seven out of district students coming into our program. And you will also note that we will no longer receive reimbursement for the shared employees from MSAD 35. Technology Director Chris Russo and Installation and Service Technician uh, Steve Batal will not be shared between MSAD 60 and MSAD 35 starting next year. The need for dedicated staff in both of the districts is too great uh, with all of our technology demands. And that um, Chris has done a phenomenal job. We've had several conversations about this, but just uh, the amount of use and the amount of demand on our technology department is is huge. Um, so just kind of circling back, as you remember, our two goals for this budget cycle focus on social emotional learning and supports and continued work on increasing literacy skills for all students in kindergarten to grade 12. We've been fortunate to receive another federal COVID related grant, 
which we will use for fiscal year 22 to further address educational recovery. And that's what we call learning loss. So when you hear learning loss, our district is calling it educational recovery um, for math and literacy um, to support multi-tiered systems of support, which has previously been called RTI. So it's just addressing um, different levels of support for students in the classroom. So uh, like the tier one is, is the whole class, tier two is a little more um, targeted instruction, tier three is a little more targeted instruction. Uh, so our grant will address um, that for reading and literacy and math. Our remote academy will also um, mm. fall into that category, technology, school nutrition. Um, and all of those areas that I just mentioned focus on our those two goals that we had for this budget cycle. Um, so that's kind of a, a really broad overview. Um, and we just wanted to present that this evening. We have, and as we've said, we have scheduled the March 11th date to meet with cost centers um, as a scheduled workshop. So um, Travis and Joanne, you, you were, you've been on the committee for facilities and finance. Do you wanna add something before we kind of open it up for some initial questions or um, clarifying points? Um, yeah, I just wanted to touch on that list that you got there. That's a, that's not a dead in the water list. Uh, there's still some working back and forth as we go. Uh, there's some stuff in the budget, like our insurance, that's kind of estimated at one level. Um, but we're hopeful that by the time we have to have a final budget, our final, final budget ready to go out for vote, we will have our insurance rate at a set level, which will allow us to have either a, you know, some wiggle room to put in some of these dire things that we're cutting out or continue to lower down our uh, burden on the tax people. So other than that, I think they did a phenomenal job uh, coming in as, as low as they potentially could. There's not really a whole lot of more that we can keep cutting over here before we end up starting to cut positions. Yeah, I agree with everything Travis said. Um, one thing that we did want to, um, the not go below was our fund balance. We wanted to try to keep that at 750000 That really, um, with Denise, with her guidance, she said, we really, that's a level that we don't want to go below. So um, that's one thing we need to keep in mind as we look at the um, things that we, are, um, that we have on the decision list. Um, we've already brought it down to 750,000. So there really isn't any extra money um, in that area that we want to take. So that is the only other thing I wanted to add. And I think Travis is right. We really worked really hard to, to get it to where it is now. So while this presentation was pretty, um, you know, succinct, it's because we're not adding we don't have all these additions we've really really honed in on what is essential nice job you guys um i have a question um maybe sue the the remote academy i know one of the long-term goals is that it it could actually possibly generate revenue. Is that something that we might be ready for this coming fall or whatever? Like, or is that, are we still a ways off with that? We're playing musical. Um, who Whose mic is on is what we're playing over here. Mm -hmm. um, I would not say that we're gonna be ready for the fall to be able to, to do that. However, what I do think is that our goal is to be able to bring some of our um, folks that have gone into the homeschool land mm. back to the district, which is obviously a benefit to us ter in terms of subsidy for numbers of students still attending. Um, there's, I, I don't dare say anything right now, Denise, about it. I think we're we're working really hard to to hire or potentially hire the best. Um, folks possible and really are focusing on that sixth, seventh and eighth grade piece. Um, and my, my, my gut tells me it'll be a little like our Mary Heard Academy where things will um, evolve 
in a short order to get to a place where we're able to generate some revenue, but I, I don't dare put it out there as a, a for sure. Um, biggest concern right now is trying to get back the kids that we've lost, you know, yeah. to other options. Yeah. Um, one other question, either from a staffing or kind of space issue, but I know we're expecting a bubble of kindergartners coming in. Are we sort of in good shape with them? I mean, it's not like we, we didn't drop any teachers for that, but just wondering how that's playing out. Yes, we added that um, that net other section to North Berwick in anticipation of having a little larger pocket there. There were about eight students that um, either had registered and decided not to come this year and hold out, or we've heard of those students that will be coming in. So that's why that position is in there. And I think I would also like to put a plug in to just say, you know, we're looking at the numbers in fourth grade at Knowlton School as well. Um, we may need to add a position there and we can certainly wait until the summer just to see how that teases out a little bit. And we, at that point, will have a, you know, we'll have some um, more, some firmer numbers on our insurance and we can look through, across the budget at that point in time uh, to absorb that if we needed to. Uh, but is that, that in here or it's not in here it's yet? It's not in here because we have a plan to be able to address it if we need to. Okay. Um, okay. And again, kindergarten is always the unknown. You know, <laughs> sometimes, you know, like at Hussey School, historically, you know, we would have, you know, 60 children in May. And then by September, 110 of them have, read, you know, are, are coming. Yeah. So it's always, always the, the interesting grade level for us. Yeah. I had some questions on some specific tabs. Is that for the uh, March 11th meeting or is that right now? We can address those or if you want to wait till March 11th until you're actually talking to that cost center, you can do that as well. But we're prepared to answer to the best that we can. We think. We think. Okay. <laughs> um, I won't do all of them. I will just do a couple sure. that um, I think we're kind of towards the top. Uh, in tab nine, I just wondered what is the general maintenance um, details on that? Just because of the plus 41,000, it kind of jumped out at me. A minute to open our books. Yeah. <laughs> Give us a little more step. Is it what page number are you on? Page three. Oh, good. I left my mute off. Um, yep, she's right. Page three. <laughs> and it was, oh, actually, um, it was the one that's listed as 48,000. And last year it was um, 6,250. Yeah. And there she is. <laughs> we cannot hear you, Denise. Okay. Yep. Now. Yep. <laughs> okay. That is the um, the cost of things off our general maintenance list, which is in tab ten. Um, so in tab ten, we have two lists. We have a capital improvement project list. And then we have a general maintenance project list. And um, what, what happens is some of these 20 projects for 22 are just, we purchase the materials and our own staff um, puts the project together. And in other cases, we contract out the service. So it's the difference from year to year will always just be dependent on what projects are picked. And, um, and whether or not they're being done in-house or whether they're being contracted out. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, what was the other one? Let's see. Um, I can skip that, that's just a little one. Tab 11, and we don't actually have to turn to it. Um, just my question was, it's about the Levin and Tractor. Do the other schools all have them? And just want to make sure that there's actually a, a, a need for one. 
Right. Um, the other schools do actually have them. Um, they assist with various projects around the, the campuses. Um, we, in speaking to Kevin Moore, he he was thinking that that was definitely a need. Um, I think he can probably answer more specifics for you um, next week when he's here. Um, but we have teased that out, and he he is saying that that is a need for him. Okay. Um, and I will just do one more. Um, the. In tab 18, we have um, the National Honor Society. And then I noticed there's a separate listing for Spanish Honor Society and French Honor Society. I was just wondering um, if why they weren't in under the same umbrella. I don't have the answer to that. I, I think, um, I don't know if Joe will be better able to answer that next week or if you know, Sue. I, uh, ready, turning up. Um, Basically, each of those honor societies have their own criteria. So the, the it's specific to the language, like the Spanish one and the French one. Um, typical National Honor Society is the one that that everybody sort of thinks of in their head about like a certain grade point average and um, service and all that kind of stuff. But the um, the two languages are specific to their to French and to, to Spanish. So. And and they're actually relatively new. I think they've been in for probably five or six years. Okay, thank you. But maybe Joe can answer more. I mean, I honestly, I I think that it's they they actually do a ton of work in the foreign language, not just strictly the overall National Honor Society world. Rebecca. Rebecca. Uh, sounds like I'm going to have to leave here in a second. Okay. Hope everything is good. Rebecca, you had your hand up whether you knew it or not. Oh, no, I didn't mean to. Sorry. <laughs> I must have clicked that oh, by wait. accident. Okay. Sorry. That's all right. Does anybody else have questions just for tonight? Or you, I mean, time, it's, it's quite a bit of um, information, obviously. And we'll have some opportunity to meet with um, all of the cost centers next week. How are we doing that? Is that um, like, are people coming in in person? Are we doing it remotely with little breakout rooms? How do right. we're gonna We're gonna have the magic of Chris Russo and we're gonna have separate little breakout rooms that you guys can pop in and out of. Um, basically, everybody will have their own space, and you and you're all going to be invited, and you can pop in and out. Okay, um, so all we like show up. A, we'll do it. We'll do a, a specific amount of time, like a 30 minute time frame, where you can go um, visit each whoever you need to, whoever you need to. And we'll take a running tally. I'll see who gets the most the most hits. Right, that would be kind of fun for them. Like, it'll be a bet. Hmm. <laughs> so. Does anyone have any other questions at this point about the budget? Um, I would, if you guys can send out that um, the sheet that you went over, uh, that was very helpful. In your mailbox, I already sent it. Right. And actually, Audra, your sort of opening remarks were also really helpful. I'd love to be able to read that again. Absolutely. Sure. All right. Question. Oh, yeah. we, you've already done an update. In the, and is that, I'm assuming they got emailed to us. Are we going to have another one? Should I bother to print that out or? The overview that yeah. she just did? No, no. I'm talking about you. We've got the original budget in here, but then there was, you have updated when you brought it down to the 4%. Yep. I think we've. I thought we had sent them out. Well, they're well, you might have, but I haven't printed them out yet. So I'm just wondering, are we going to do more? Should I wait? Hold on one second. We printed them out. Yeah. They need to be picked up at some, some okay. point. So we have them direction. ready to be picked up here. Um, so you, you tell us what you need. Would you like us to send them over to the Lebanon Elementary School? Does anybody else need um, them set out for you? We can take care of it. What works best for you, Nancy? Do you want to swing by Lebanon? Um, I'm not going to be here. That's the problem. Oh, okay. So, okay. Um, well, 
we, if we, there, uh, I can use, a, I'll check the email and see if I can just use what's there. Okay, because we definitely sent them out as an electronic version as well, or no? Did, okay. Yeah. Oh, Jen shared it all. Gotcha. Okay. Okay. All right. If you need anything more, just in terms of any of you guys, just um, just reach out to us and we'll make sure you're taken care of. Okay. Okay. Yeah. okay. All right. What's next? Um, staff employment. Oh yes. Hold on. I have to... <laughs> oh my god. Oh my god. Okay. Nancy, would would it be helpful if we mailed the the draft, the, this next draft to you? Um yeah, we have time. Yeah, that would work. We can get that out to you. Yep. Okay. We'll get it out tomorrow. It's out right here. So we'll just send that right out. Okay. All right. Thank you. Sure. Sure. So we have um, a request for a leave of absence for Caitlin Fink, who's first grade at Hanson Elementary School. Uh, she's asking for the leave of absence for the 21-22 school year. Um, we do need a consideration and action on that. So can you just remind me, the a leave of absence obviously is different than a sabbatical. So it's just, it's an unpaid leave, but she would have her position back. Correct. And she would need to notify us by March of next year of her intent to come back or to resign. Okay. Somebody want to make a motion? This is Joanne. I'll make that motion to accept her leave of absence. You get a second? I'll second. All in favor? Nancy? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Any other appointment changes? We do. We have a retirement uh, from North Berwick Elementary School. We have Marjorie Smith, Margie Smith, who is our speech and therapist at North Berwick. She was at Hussey. She was at Berwick Elementary. Um, this is 25 years of teaching in the school district. Um, so Margie Smith has put in her note for retirement. And we do need a motion for that. What a year to leave on. Yes. <laughs> this, is Joanne. Yeah. this is Joanne, I'll make the motion to accept Margie's uh, resignation or retirement with regret. Happy for her, but we'll miss her. Yes. Yeah. We get a second. I'll second to two. <laughs> All in favor? Any others? Yes, we have three resignations. We have Kristen Bennett, who is currently on a leave of absence. She uh, was the school counselor at Hanson Elementary School, and she has sent in her letter of resignation. We have Nikki Dawes, who is also on a leave of absence. She was a fifth grade teacher in North Berwick, and she has um, submitted her resignation letter. And then Andrew Karakosikas, I think, and I probably didn't do it right, but Mr. K, um, that's what we call him for obvious reasons. Um, and he was a special education teacher at the Knowlton School, and he has um, submitted his resignation uh, for right now. The other ones are, the other two are just not returning in the fall and his is effective now okay. okay we need we need to accept those as well right yeah. okay this is joanne i'll um, make a motion to accept the resignations i'll second three for three <laughs> yep yeah. all in favor thank you um do we have any others I, we don't at the at the uh, our level here okay all right i think we're i think we're good to adjourn somebody yeah. wants to input number two we what we have more public input more oh okay great okay i'm gonna move we might so you might need to up your mic a little bit a little bit I'm working on it. How's that? Can you hear yeah. me? Okay? Okay. Yeah.
Um, and it's just one, I believe, at this moment. Yep. Uh, Christine Sheldon of Lebanon, it's time to resume a normal school schedule. These kids are depressed and it will take a long time to recover from this. The number of mental health issues skyrocketed. It's safe for these kids to get back to school and make up all the lost time learning. Science says it's safe for them to return. Let those who want to stay remote learning do that. Let the other do classes and sports, social activities. Enough already. And that is the end of public input. Um, okay, I guess we can get a motion to adjourn. This is Joanne. I'll make a motion to adjourn. Yeah. Go, Joanne. I'll second it. Ah, what is she right Never mind. <laughs> all right. All in favor? <clears throat> Who did? Yeah. All right. That's you, I think. Thank you all. Thanks, everybody. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. <laughs> okay. <clears throat>